It's likely that an awful lot of fights in your life start with words. Somebody says something, and you just can't help yourself, right? You got to go back at them. You got to retort, you got to respond, you got to let them know why they're wrong. And, and it starts escalating a little bit, it gets a little bit louder, a little bit sharper, a little bit more focused. Maybe a few words that you don't normally use start to slip out. And before long, people get hurt. Relationships get destroyed. And you realize you can never unspeak those words. It's what sometimes we call fighting words. Somebody says something and you're not going to let it rest. You got to go back at it. And sometimes we say, oh, them are fighting words. We, we use that in the context of defending honor. You're not going to talk about me that way. You're not going to say that. We're going to fight if you do that. Come to Ephesians 6 this morning. What most people know about Ephesians 6 is the armor of God, right? You've heard that passage preached, and you know what all the armor is, and, and you got all this, you know, maybe you grew up in Sunday school, and you can still see the guy on the wall, right, with the, the breastplate and the helmet and the sword and all the stuff, the shoes and the whole, the whole works. you got that image in your mind. But too often, our st- our stories and our discussions about the armor of God stop with verse 17. We never get to the fighting words. We never get to the fact that God has designed spiritual warfare to include fighting words, words that fight back against the power of the devil. Look at verse number 13 for a moment. I'm sorry, verse number 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Your biggest problem is not the person sitting next to you or the person in front of you, or the person behind you, or the person that's not here that's in your mind this morning, the last person you fought with, that's not your biggest problem. I'm not saying they're not a problem. I'm just saying it's not your biggest one. That's not your real battle. It's not flesh and blood. What is it? It's, it's the rulers. It's the powers. It's, it's the world forces of darkness. It's the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And some of you are like, well, tell me what all that is. If I do that, we'll never get to... Verse 18 this morning. But what those are, 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 I think, spiritual forces of darkness. Why do I think that? Because that's what it says. Some of you know the answer to that question, right? They're, they're, they're spiritual forces, forces, forces of spiritual warfare going into heaven. And, and, and you can't see it. You can't see it. Some of you, you know, you get voices in your head, and I know you talk back to them. Right? But, but, but you can't see it. How do we fight spiritual warfare? With spiritual words. Fighting words. What are the fighting words that God calls for us? It's these, the, these words that come out of a heart that is burdened with something that's carrying around a weight and you don't know what else to do with it. Maybe you're one of these kind of people who from time to time you just need to vent. And maybe you have somebody you'll call up and you'll unload on them. And, and they're kind enough to listen to you. And they probably hope you do it on the phone so they can pretend to listen while they're doing something else. And you can't see them, right? But you're kind of, you just got to unload. You just got to let it go. Listen, there's an aspect of what we're talking about this morning. The fighting words of life is that sometimes we just need to unload. We, we just got to let it go. Sometimes, some, sometimes in the midst of... Of, of life in the midst of our difficulties and our battles and our, and our spiritual struggles and our life struggles that we may not have realized are spiritual yet. Sometimes we just want to talk to somebody. We need to ask some questions. I, somebody last night, just uh, they come up and say, hey, I need some advice. You tell me what I should do about this. So I told them and they completely disregarded it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> makes me feel pretty good, but, but hey, whatever. All right, but, but you guys, I need some advice. I need somebody to talk to. I need to ask somebody something. Maybe, maybe you come across a, a battle in your life like, I've got no possible answer to this. I don't know what to do, and if I knew what to do, I couldn't bring it about anyway. I need to go to somebody who can. What is prayer? Prayer is simple talking to God. Prayer is the simple recognition that there is a God who's bigger than me and stronger than me with more authority for, than me who can do for me what I can't do for myself. And in the midst of my deep spiritual struggles, in the midst of my life heartaches, and my relationship difficulties, and my job tragedies, 
and my physical ailments, in the midst of everything in my life, I'm going to fight back with the words of prayer. You see, because, because ultimately my battle is not with somebody else. Ultimately, my battle is is with the spiritual forces of wickedness in many places. And I'll be honest with you this morning, I don't know exactly how that works. I don't know how that spiritual warfare kind of thing goes on. I am convinced on the one hand that demons get an awful lot of credit for things they got nothing to do with. Sometimes it's just us being stupid, right? All right. Now, I think they're willing to take the credit for that because, hey, they're fighting against God and anything they can do that, that, that helps defeat God in their minds is good. But many times... What happens is we get so focused on things that we forget, ultimately, God is the one with authority. God is the one with authority. God is the one who's bigger than us and bigger than any kind of force or any kind of spiritual forces of wickedness, any kind of forces of darkness. God's bigger than all that. And here in the midst of spiritual warfare, in the midst of the difficulties of your lives, here's what God says to do. Pray. Now, in verse number 18, this is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. I want you to see the word for, I'm sorry, the word all appears full t- four times with all prayer and petition. Pray at all times. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Now, some of you might have a translation that, that, that translates the word all a little bit different. You might have every or something like that in some of those. But, but I want to show you this morning because I want you to be, dare I say, I want you to be all in on the subject of prayer. And I hate cheesy cliches, okay? But I don't hate them too much to use one. Now, I want you to be all in this morning on verse number 18. Let's talk about what it means to pray because I want you to, I want you to understand this morning that prayer is something God desires from us. Prayer is something God commands of us. And so let's figure out what he says in this verse. For alls, here's the first one, pray all kinds of prayers. Look at verse number 18, with all prayer and petition. Those are two different words for prayer. Two different words for prayer. Now, some of you know the New Testament well enough, and and maybe you've included the Old Testament well to know there's like a whole bunch of different words that the Bible uses for prayer. And it's an interesting study to kind of trace some of those out. There's, there's thanksgiving, there's requests, there's, there's petitions, there's confessions, there's, there's prayers, there's all kinds of, of words we use. And sometimes we, we, we kind of in our minds, we get, we get, you know, trying to figure out what all these are. You know what God wants from us? He wants all kinds of prayers and requests. That's the way the NIV translates it, all kinds of prayers. The focus here is not there's this kind of prayer and that kind of prayer. It's, it's there's prayer. And, and it looks a bunch of different ways and takes a bunch of different forms. There's, there's supplications. There's all these things. And, and here's the good news of the gospel. The good news of prayer is that God is not telling us here to pray a certain kind of prayer for a certain kind of thing. He's telling us to pray all kinds of prayers for all kinds of things. With all prayer and petition. And, and this is where prayer gets confusing for some people. Because you see all these different words that are translated in different ways in your, in your Bible. And sometimes you come up to a situation and say, what kind of prayer am I supposed to be praying here? Is this, is this a prayer of intercession? Is this a prayer of supplication? Is this, is this a request? Is it an entreaty? Is it a thanksgiving? Is it just a prayer? What, what in the world am I supposed to be doing? And the good news is that God is not sitting up in heaven hearing you pray and refusing to listen because you prayed the wrong one. Don't you like that? I mean, we, we have, you know, with, with uh, as we're talking to people, and you, you raise kids, and you got the magic word, right? And, and you, don't, you don't answer until you get that magic word. God's not like that. He's a much better parent than we are. He, he's not sitting up saying, no, 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 you didn't use the right kind of prayer, not answering that one. God wants all kinds of prayers. He, he doesn't say, you know, if you'd used a prayer of supplication, I would have answered you, but you used a prayer of entreaty instead. Do bad. That's not God. God is a God who longs to hear our prayers. How do we know God longs to hear our prayers? Because he told us to pray. He told us to pray because he wants us to pray. And he wants us to pray all kinds of prayers. Listen, just pray. Just talk to God. Sometimes we use church words for, you know, tell God what's on your heart. What in the world does that mean? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I, my heart's probably got some cholesterol on it, and, 
You know, maybe some fats and trans fats and lipids and I don't know what all that stuff is. We, get, you know, we can use these church words and sometimes we kind of get lost in it. What does it mean to pray? Prayer is simply talking to God about what you're thinking about. Talk to God about what you're concerned about. What has you afraid? What are you scared of? What, what, what makes you glad? What is it that, that, that you wish you had that you don't have? That's what you talk to God about. See, prayer isn't kind of some fancy words that you put together. You've got to get in just the right order. One of the things that the Bible tells us about Daniel is, in the book of Daniel is before you spoke the words, I knew. Do you understand this morning? Isn't that beautiful? Before you ever pray, God knows what you're going to pray. And God is ready to answer those prayers in, in one form or one fashion or another. Now, I know where some of you just went with that. You're like, okay, if God already knows what I'm going to pray, then, then why pray? I'm not ready for that part of the message yet. You've got to hold on to that one for a few minutes. All right? But here's what I want you to get this morning. Pray all kinds of prayers. and j- j- Just pray. Talk to God. Tell Him what's on your heart. Tell Him what you're concerned about. Tell Him what you want. Tell Him what you're afraid of. Ask Him. Pray. Here's the second all. Not just all kinds of prayers, but pray at all kinds of times. Verse number 18 again. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray at all times. Um, what, what Paul's saying here is it's supposed to be a constant feature of your life. We use the word, you know, verse like 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer. We, we hear words like this and sometimes think, well, how in the world am I supposed to pray without ceasing? Because I got a job I got to hold down. I, I, got, I got a family I got to take care of. I, I got other stuff. How am I supposed to pray without ceasing? And, and some people have said, well, this means maintain a constant attitude of prayer. And I get that. You know, I, I understand that. Um, some people say, you know, it means, you, you know, be praying here and there. And I, I think what it means is just pray without ceasing. I think it means all throughout the day you just you just Carry on a running conversation with God. I mean, now there are times where, yeah, you got to carry, carry on a conversation with somebody next to you. But, but have you ever thought about how much time during the day you have that you just waste? I mean, I, that's a disturbing thought. I mean, I look back and think, you know, where did the day go? Where did the week go? Where did the month go? But, but think about it this way. What if you, and I've, I've suggested this before. Let me, let me suggest again. What if you started driving in the car with no radio on and you just started using that time to pray your commute to work is 10 15 minutes right off the bat you'd have about 30 minutes of prayer time and your only other option is listen to the radio not like you can read a book All right yeah you might make a phone call to somebody and talk to them for a while but but you could you could also talk to god I mean, what, what, if, what if you devoted your time when you're in the shower to prayer? Now, it's not like you can even talk to somebody on the phone at that time. That'd be a little awkward in a couple of different ways. But what if you just said, you know, I'm going to take a shower and I'm going to spend the time in the shower talking to God? We sing in the shower. Why not talk to God? You see, there's a whole lot of times. So you, you get out of your car in the parking lot and, and, and you walk into your job. What if you use that time to pray? I mean, you, you could look around at the beauty of creation and use that time for a prayer of thanksgiving. You, you, might, you might see your coworker's car and think, hey, you know, I, I remember they got a problem. Let me pray for them on the way. What if you just started sapping up these little extra minutes of the day that just get wasted right now? And start devoting that time to prayer. You see, I think that's what Paul's talking about when he says, at all times, be praying. Pray at all times. Keep that prayer, that running conversation going on. I think one of the difficulties we have with prayers is that sometimes we do think that prayer is a set of magic words that you have to start in a particular way and end in a particular way. And maybe you've picked this up from church. Where, where maybe you grew up in a Sunday school class with a teacher and you can still quote the prayer because you heard it every week for, you know, 12 years. 
And you can still quote the, the, the very verbiage they use, the very words they use. I'm not saying that's bad. Okay, I'm not saying it's bad. But, but understand this, that, that you don't have to start every prayer with dear Jesus or dear Heavenly Father. Most of you don't start your conversations with your spouse that way, right? You just jump right in. Now, I'm not saying it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt to start with dear something, okay? That's not a bad thing, but that's not the way. You, you see, you just have this running conversation that goes on. And, and, and sometimes we think it's, you know, these magical set of words. Sometimes I think, well, I can't really end a prayer unless I say, in Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, there's something really important about praying in Jesus' name. But that's not a magical tagline that suddenly sprinkles all over everything else and makes it okay. To pray in Jesus' name means simply to pray for something Jesus would pray for. Use Jesus' name because Jesus would approve this prayer. And now we have all these political advertisements. I approve this message. There's a sense in which praying in Jesus' name means praying for something Jesus would approve of. Praying for something that Jesus would want his name attached to. But here's the thing. Uh, if, if you're in the middle of prayer and the phone rings and you don't have to hurry up and get in Jesus' name, amen, real quick before you answer the phone. Because God doesn't work that way. He just wants to pray all the time. Just, just be in this, this constant running conversation with God. The good news is that God's not like us as parents sometimes. When, when your child starts telling you the same thing they've told you 43 times already. You're like, stop. I know. God's not like that. If you've told God 43 times already, you know what you can do? Tell him 44. Tell him 45. Pray. Just talk to God. Now, notice what he says here. Do it in the Spirit. In the Spirit. What in the world does that mean? Now, once you hear, see that phrase, in the Spirit, and oh, this is some kind of mysterious spiritual realm uh, of prayer. And, and there's a sense in which it is. Listen to Ephesians 2.17. Why does the Spirit matter? He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace those, to those who are near. Talking about the peace of the gospel. For through Him, Christ, we both have our access in one Spirit to the Father. Through Christ, we have access in the Spirit to the Father. Now, what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? To pray in the Spirit is not some kind of trance some kind of particular state of mind where you kind of get in, in some, kind of, you know, some kind of mental state and kind of tune everything else out. That's not praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit, again, is not a set of words. It's not a tone of voice that we use. I mean, some people think you hear somebody praying, oh, they're praying in the Spirit because they have this kind of churchy, frankly strange tone of voice. Can I just say that? I just did. Right? Some people think praying in the Spirit is, is what you do with your voice. Some people have heard praying in the Spirit, and what they think of is what the Bible describes as tongues. That's kind of the spiritual language that nobody else really knows. Um, even if this were tongues, it wouldn't apply here because this is a command given to all. And if you've studied tongues in the Bible, you know the gift of tongues was only given to certain people, not to everybody. And so God's not commanding you to pray in some kind of spiritual language that, that you don't know. And by the way, I think the gift of tongues in the Bible is a known language. The gift of tongues would be me speaking in German or me speaking in French. Right? Sometimes it feels like me speaking in English, but I know English a little bit. But speaking in tongues is speaking in a language that you've never learned. That's not what this is. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? It simply means to pray in line with the Spirit of God. God himself. To pray for what God wants. Pray for God's will. How does the Spirit communicate with us? This is, this is not intended to be a trick question, but sometimes it is. Some people think the Spirit communicates through some kind of feeling or some kind of experience around us. I would say to us this morning, the way the Spirit communicates with us is right here, through the Bible. So what does it mean to pray in the Spirit? As you read the Bible and you learn something about God or you learn something about God's word or God's will or what God wants, praying in the Spirit means pray what the Spirit has shown you from the Word of God. Pray in the Spirit. It, it, it's, not, it's not difficult. And by the way, doesn't that take a lot of burden off? It should. I mean, you're thinking, man, i got to pray in the Spirit. i got to get in this trance and see if the Spirit comes and you're just kind of waiting for it. And 
No, you can just open up your Bible, read a few words, and say, okay, God says this, let me pray for that. God says this, let me pray for that. That's what it means to pray in the Spirit. Pray as the Spirit guides you through the Scriptures. Pray as the Spirit guides you through life with the Scriptures, that the Spirit teaches us through the Scriptures what life is to be about and how I'm supposed to live. Say, God, I've seen this in your Word. Help me to live that out. That's a prayer in the Spirit. What about when you don't know? You ever come to a situation in life where you're like, man, I really ought to pray right now? I feel this tremendous urge to pray. I want to pray. I just don't have the first clue of what to say. And you open your mouth and nothing comes out. You know what I mean? It's praying the Spirit. Romans chapter 8. The Spirit helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Understand that this morning. You ever been in those times in your life where you, I need to be praying right now. This is one of those all times I got to pray. I just have this, 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 this burden. I've got to unload it, but I don't know what to say. Maybe you're facing a situation. I got, I don't know what to pray for here. I mean, part of me wants to pray for this because of A, B, and C, but then part of me wants to pray for this for X, Y, and Z, and I don't know what to pray for. God, help me. And in those times, the Spirit himself makes intercession for you with groanings that are too deep for words, the things that you can't even put voice to, the things you only have words for. The Spirit says, I'll handle that for you. Let me talk for a minute. Let me speak for you. The Spirit intercedes for us according to the will of God. You know, sometimes we pray, say, God, I don't know what your will is here. I'm just, I'm just praying, God, bring your will. But I have no idea what that is. You know what the Spirit has never done? The Holy Spirit has never prayed not knowing what the will of God is. He has never interceded for you. Uh, God, I pray for so-and-so down there. Um, I have no idea what your will is, but, but the Spirit never does that. He always intercedes for us according to the will of God. So here's my encouragement for you this morning. Pray at all times in the Spirit. Let the Spirit drive your prayers, and when you don't know what to say, depend on the Spirit to pray for you. That's what He's promised He would do. Pray all the time. Here, here's, the, here's the third one. With this in view, with this kind of spiritual prayer, with this kind of prayer of the Spirit, with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition. Be on the alert with all perseverance. So, so we're praying all kinds of prayers. We're praying at all times. Now we're praying with all perseverance. To put it slightly differently, keep on praying. If you've got an NIV, you see that this morning, the International Version. Keep on praying. That's what it means to pray for perseverance. You, you, you don't quit. You don't give up. You keep on praying. You, you keep alert. Be on the alert. You keep, remember when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying and his disciples are there with him? And he goes and prays, he comes back, they're sleeping. What does he say to them? Watch and pray so that you do not enter in temptation. That word watch is the same word right here. Be alert. Keep watching. Don't give up. Persevere in prayer. Persevere. You can't pray and then quit. You can't pray and then quit. You pray one time, like, yeah, I didn't get what I wanted, I'll just quit praying. You can't do that. You gotta persevere. You gotta keep praying. You, you can't only pray in distress. How many times do we attempt to do that? We forget God until we're hurting, and oh God, you gotta help me right now. You can't only pray in distress. You have to persevere in prayer. But you can't only pray in success. Somebody, yeah, hey, I'm praying right now because things are good. The minute things go bad, we start trying to figure it out on our own. You can't do that. You pray at all times with an attitude of perseverance. You keep going. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer. Romans 12, 12, devoted to prayer. How many of you have ever been discouraged in your prayers? Haven't we all? If you've never been discouraged in prayer, it's because you've never prayed. I get discouraged in prayer. Man, I pray for stuff. And, and it doesn't seem to happen. And you pray for stuff for years. 
and it doesn't seem to happen. Does that cause you to give up? That cause you to kind of, eh, you know, it's not working. I might as well just move on. No, you got to persevere in prayer. You don't quit praying because you haven't gotten what you desired. Hey, God, if you're not going to give me what I want on the basis of this prayer, I'm just not going to pray anymore. That's a pretty bad way to go to God. You keep on praying. Some of you have prayed for something for, for years, and you're still waiting for it. You know what you should do? Keep praying. Well, God hasn't answered me. Maybe. Maybe we put on there, God hasn't answered me yet. Maybe we will. Um, maybe, maybe God's answer has been coming across, and you simply don't know it yet. Again, I suggested last week, some of you have prayed for somebody for years. You said, God, save this person. God, change this person. And you think, man, I've been praying for this person for years, and, and God's not answering the prayer. And yet, I remind you, you don't know what's going on in their life. God may be answering a prayer, and he hasn't let you know about it yet. Because you don't see it. You're not talking to them, but, but God's doing something in them that you don't know about. Maybe, maybe God's answered your prayer in a way that isn't what you prayed for. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. Those are the words of Jesus. Who came on and said, God, I'm going to pray to you. Father, I'm going to pray to you. And I'm going to pray for this. But if I don't get it, I'm okay with that. Pray with an attitude of submission. You, you cannot give up on prayer. You know why? Because you got nothing else. As I mentioned earlier this morning, sometimes we give up on prayer and say, God, if you're going to do this for me, I'm going to do it myself. And most of you know how big a mess you've made doing that. I know I do. You know, I'm constantly putting out the fires of life that are brought about by things I did. God says, pray, keep praying, persevere in prayer, don't give up. Here's the last all. Be on the earth with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Who do we pray for? All the saints. You look across this room this morning, and you start kind of, all these people, how am I supposed to pray for all of them? And, and I don't think the answer is that in order to be obedient to this, you've got you to name every single person down the row every day. You, you don't have to do that. The praying for all the saints means there's nobody you exclude from prayer. Now, my guess is that most of us here have at some point or another said, that person made me so mad, there's no chance in anything I'm going to be praying for them. I'm just not doing it. Not after what they said to me. I'm not praying for them. That's what this is talking about. When you pray for all the saints, it means you have not given up on somebody. It means you're not letting your personal beef or your personal problems interfere with your desire to see God at work in them. I know there are people in this church that you think, man, I don't know why they're here. I wish they would go away. You don't want to see God at work in them because you want to see them punished for something they did to you. And you know what that is? That's a bad attitude towards God. That's not just a bad attitude towards them. That's a bad attitude towards God. You've got to pray for all the saints. Nobody's excluded from the reach of prayer. Nobody's excluded from the work of God. You are desirous to see God doing his work in everybody's life. And sometimes in those moments of anger, those times when you say, I don't want to pray for them. Maybe that's the time that somebody is hopefully praying for you, that God would break your heart down. And, and, and see in your life the kind of tenderness and grace that you need. You know, in praying for others, very often our minds are taken from our own concerns and directed towards others. Sometimes our biggest problem in prayer is we are the ones we pray about. God help me. God change me. God do this for me. God do this for, you know, we're, we're so inwardly focused. And sometimes this last phrase of the verse directs us outward. Now, I, I think you should pray for yourself. How much? I don't know. I mean, probably more than you do. 
I mean, we should pray for ourselves. But there comes a point where I need to be looking out here, saying, you know what, God, I need to turn my prayer away from me and turn it to other people, other saints that I know, other believers who are struggling. You see, prayer is one of the ways you participate in the struggles of others. You, people, you see people struggling with sin. And, and again, I've said often, I've got a lot of patience for people who struggle. But you know what we need to do for people who struggle? We need to pray for them. We need to pray for them that God would, that God would string them, that God would change them, that God would help them, that God would, God would do something in their life through the power of the gospel. Pray for them. What if you don't like them? Pray for them. Pray for them particularly. What if you don't want to see God help them, like I mentioned a moment ago? Repent and then pray for them. Pray for all the saints. Listen, there's a lot of stuff there. By the way, um, you know, as you think of members in the church, it, it might be a good idea to pick a certain number of people to pray for each day. You know, maybe in your, in your uh, adult Bible fellowship class on Sunday morning or, or the group of people you hang around with, just you think of it, you don't have to pray for everybody every day, but maybe just set a certain amount of people aside each day and say, I'm going to pray for these people. Maybe you have a prayer list and, and you write some people's names down. And you pray for them. Maybe some, somebody comes up to you and says, you know, I'm really struggling with this. And in the course of conversation, you, you break out those words. Well, I'll pray for you. And I fear that I'll pray for you is often a way to end the conversation. You know, you've heard enough of this. I'll pray for you. And you hope that kind of satisfies them to quit talking. And then you can move on to things you're more interested in. All right. Um, again, repent. And then actually pray for them. Do it right then. All right, while, while it's on your mind, you might also do it later, but do it right then. And that way, when next time you say, hey, I prayed for you about that. How's that going? Pray for all people. Listen, the, the, the opportunities for prayer are wide open. There are no limits on time. There are no limits on topics. There are some people, you call them at midnight, they're not answering the phone. God's not like that. There are some people, you bring up certain topics with them. They say, no, 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 I'm not talking about that with you. God's never like that. There's no limit on times or topics. All prayer at all times with all perseverance for all the saints. Now, why don't we do this? Well, sometimes we don't do it because we're discouraged. We didn't get what we wanted, so we fail on the third one. We didn't persevere. We gave up. So, sometimes we're apathetic. We just don't care about people that much. Well, we fail on the fourth one. I, I'm not praying for all the saints because, frankly, I don't care about all the saints. Leave here on Sunday morning, nobody crosses your mind until next Sunday when you see him again. We're, we're apathetic. Sometimes we pray because we're self-reliant. We don't need God. We fail on the first one. All prayer and petition, I don't need to pray because I don't need God. I can, I can handle this myself. Sometimes we don't pray because we're distracted. We're too busy. We don't persevere. We've, we've kind of gotten distracted with a shiny thing over here. Maybe we're just lazy. Sometimes we don't pray because we're not sure what to say. But at heart, let me ask you this question. God says pray. It's a command, right? If you don't pray, why is it that you don't pray? Because you're disobedient. I don't know. Did you, did you see me going in there? Did you, did you hear that one coming? We got all kinds of reasons we don't pray, but at the heart of it is we are disobeying God. God says pray. When we don't, it's because we're not doing what God commanded us to do. And when we don't do what God commanded us to do, we're sinning against Him. We're disobeying Him. Now, I could use that this morning to put you on a guilt trip. And send you home and say, from now until 5.30, make sure you're on your knees praying. My knees wouldn't handle it that long. Yours probably wouldn't either. The good news is you don't have to do that. Because we can come to God at any time, in any posture, with any prayer, and know that He hears us. You, you see, the, the, the answer to the disobedience of prayer is not a guilt trip. It's an opportunity. 
that say the God who raised Jesus from the dead has all the power that raised Jesus from the dead and he's willing to be at work in your life. And so pray. All kinds of prayers at all kinds of times with all perseverance for all people. Pray. Now here's the hard question. I brought this up earlier and said I'd get back to it. We're back to it. If God already knows, I'm going to pray. And in fact, God already knows what he's going to do. Why should I pray? Look at verse number 19. Pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known the boldness of the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, now let me explain this verse real quickly because there's some kind of church ideas in here. If you're new to church, this might not be familiar to you, but let me, let me just explain to you what Paul is saying here. I am a preacher of God's word. My job is to go out and tell people about the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that we're all sinners, every single one of us, and that sin separates us from God. And the good news of the gospel is that God became one of us in Jesus so that he could live the life we should have lived and that he could die the death we should die. And by faith, we can have eternal life and forgiveness. And, 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 and so he says, pray for me that I'll be able to tell people this so that they can believe. Because if they don't hear the message, they're not going to believe. If they don't hear this message, they're never going to have salvation because you have to hear it in order to believe it. And you have to believe it in order to be saved. And you can't believe unless you've heard. So pray for me that I can say it boldly and say it clearly. Let me ask you something. Any, any of you ever struggled with, with sharing the gospel with your friends? Have any ever ever had a conversation or standing there saying, you know what, right now this would be, be a great time to talk about Jesus, but let's talk about the tigers because they're better. We just get scared. It's like, ah. You just can't get it to come out. Paul's saying, pray for me that I won't do that. Now let me direct your attention back to chapter 1 for a moment. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Now let me ask you a question. What, is, what are those verses teaching us? Is that from eternity past... From before the foundation of the world, God has chosen us in Him. You like that? Man, I love that. I love the fact that God chose us to be saved. God chose us to be in Him in love. He predestined us to be one of His sons. And so if God chose everybody in eternity past who was going to be one of His, and God predestined them, why should we pray? Because aren't they going to be saved anyway? And here's my answer to that. In verse, chapter number 6, verses 19 and 20, why does Paul ask people to pray for him? Because Paul believes that prayer works. Paul believes that prayer is an important part of how God brings about Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Prayer is how God brings that about. Now, I don't understand how that works. I really don't. Here's what I know. Is chapter 1, verses 3 through 6, say what they say. And I really don't have a lot of options to explain them any other way. I think that's just what it says. And, and, and I encourage you to read that. Isn't that what it says? And I understand that chapter 6, verses 19, 20, Paul says, Pray for me so that I can be bold because if I don't be bold with the gospel, people aren't going to hear and they're not going to believe. And how those two things fit together... I don't have a clue. The good news is that I pray that God will call out the people to himself for whom Christ died. And I understand that he does it through the preaching of the gospel. And so I stand up here this morning. Here's what I say to you. Some of you are outside of Christ. Some of you are separated from God. And one of the prayers that I've prayed, and particularly this week, I prayed. Because some of you here this morning, you need to cross that line of faith. 
and I prayed for you. And by the way, there's some other people who have prayed for you this morning. They don't even know your name. I'd love to know your name, but I don't yet. But I know this morning that God's at work in some of you. And God's saying, you know what? You are a sinner who is separated from God. And you have no hope whatsoever. Hey, you can be a better person here. You can reform your life a little bit and do, do a few different things here and there. But that can't get you to God. You need Jesus. Jesus came and lived the life you should have lived, and he died to death you should die. And here's what he says, come and trust me. Turn from yourself and trust what I did for you. God's calling you to do that this morning. And I prayed for you. Not even knowing who you are. Pray, God, draw people to yourself. Because I believe that God is doing that. Listen, I've said before, if I thought that you following Christ was dependent on me being a good speaker and telling the right stories and saying things just right, I'd never do this again. But I believe this morning when the gospel is preached, when the word of God is taught, that God is at work in that. Because of our prayers and through our prayers, God is bringing about things that he has ordained from eternity past. And so this afternoon, I'm going to leave the church, I, the, the building. I'm not leaving the church. All right. I'm going to go home. I'm going to take a nap. And I'm not going to think back, oh, what if I'd said that differently? Now, sometimes I'm tempted to do that. Sometimes I'm tempted to go, man, I messed that one up. I believe God's at work through what's been said here. I believe God's doing something. Now, here's my thing to you this morning. Some of you need to cross that line of faith. You need to come to Christ. And I prayed for you. And other people prayed for you. And God says to you this morning through the preaching of his word, and he's not speaking to you in an audible voice, but he says to you this morning, come, turn to Christ in faith. Receive salvation that's only in Christ. Give up everything else. Do that this morning. In a few moments, we're going to stand and sing a song, Lord, I need you. You need him, whether you know it or not. And so come to him this morning. Here's what I'd love. Pastor Jerry's going to be here at the front in a few moments. And if you want to come down here to the front, we'd love to take a Bible and talk to you. Maybe you want to do it after we're done singing. Just come down and say, hey, can I ask you a question? Can you help me understand this? I'd love to. Pastor Jerry would love to. Hey, a lot of people, if you're a lady here this morning, have one of our ladies talk to you. But don't put it off. We have prayed for this. Respond to Christ. Some of you this morning, I encourage you this. Pray. You've been a Christian for years. Don't give up your prayers. God is at work in them. Pray all kinds of prayers at all kinds of times with all kinds of perseverance for all kinds of people. Pray. Rest in God. Our musicians are going to come. So we close this morning, Lord, I need you. That's the heart of prayer. Let's believe it this morning. Let's rest in it as we sing it together. Father, in Jesus' name, teach us to pray. Teach us to trust. There are things we don't know how your eternal plans work out with our prayers. We don't understand all that. But we're going to pray because you told us to, and we're going to trust because you've told us to, and understand that in the end you are bringing about your good and your glory through the things that you have ordained. So we'll trust you for that and rest in you. Lord, we need you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.